Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Virtual Sun session. My name is Caitlin Walker and I'm a part of the marketing team here at Lairdall. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during this session, please share them via the Q&A feature that can be found at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring them during this session and we will also have time at the end for questions. Recordings will be emailed to you after this session is over. Now, I would like to introduce Neil Weber, our president for Lairdall America. Thanks, Caitlin. Good afternoon and welcome to our first in a series of simulation user network presentations brought to you by Lairdall. Again, I'm Neil Weber, president of Lairdall Medical North America. Our simulation user network, or SUN community, is designed to keep you connected to each other and connected with patients and experts in simulation. Like many organizations, we had to cancel our Sun Conference this year, but that's not going to stop us from serving you the way you've come to expect and delivering great content. So the gracious help of our speakers, we're bringing you interesting and timely topics in simulation virtually, and we hope you'll join us for the entire series. 2020 has been a tough year for all of us. We've all had to adjust to new ways of working and doing things, and we're here to support you moving forward. On behalf of the entire organization, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Now, I'd like to get the meeting underway by introducing our moderator, Andrew Christopic. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Christopic. I'm the Senior Content Marketing Manager for Lairdall Medical, and uh, I'm privileged and humbled to be introducing to you today our first in the line of um, Virtual Sun uh, speakers uh, for, for this year, Melody Bethards from Des Moines Area Community College. Welcome, uh, Melody. We're really glad that you're here. Um, Melody and I have gotten a chance to get to know each other over the past couple of days, and um, I asked her, what would you share with people as an icebreaker? What, uh, what would you tell them about your lives? And I thought it was pretty cool that you're um, heavily involved in 4-H of, of, uh, of all things out, outside of, of your world in medicine and in healthcare. Um, and 4-H is going to be a little challenging this year with, with everything being in a virtual environment, isn't it? Welcome aboard, yeah, Bill. Did. Please, yeah. welcome aboard and welcome to, you know, feel free to say hi to everybody. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I am very excited by this opportunity to be able to uh, share what we are doing in the virtual realm right now. But as um, Andrew said, I, as in my spare time, um, I actually am a 4-H judge. I judge communication and personal development, which is, again, kind of ties in directly with what I do for nursing, which is help to hone those uh, leadership, communication, um, types of experiences for um, poor teachers as well as nursing students. So they actually do tie together very well. Excellent. Thank you. So our, our, our topic today is creating a virtual disaster response team simulation learning experience. Um, that's all about how to make preparedness part of your, your daily mindset and, and how to give people a different perspective from the strategic level uh, not just at the tactical level of, of health care. So before we begin, uh, we'd like to ask all of you, our audience, uh, a question, and thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, so our very first question is, have you ever created abstract scenarios for your students or your learners that are purely situational? Um, scenarios that involve no uh, clinical application. So we're gonna give everybody, it's an easy question, it's a yes, no. Well, maybe not an easy question, but it's easy to answer, it's a yes, no answer. So we're just gonna give everyone a minute to chime in. Uh, we'd like to see who has done something like this uh, using abstract scenarios to engage their, their students or their learners. So we'll just give it a few more minutes. And Melody and I get a, a little message at the bottom that says, uh, host and panelists can't vote. So we don't get to participate in this. We can't skew the, uh, we can't skew the answers. So the answer should come up in just a minute. So kind of split. All right, almost 50-50. So 40% 
of our audience has actually created an abstract scenario um, to engage their learners and 60% haven't. I hope that's useful information for you, Melody, as we go forward. Um, so why don't we, why don't we uh, march forward here and talk about who else is doing this outside of, of healthcare? So we, we had this uh, discussion that um, the nuclear industry does it, right? The aviation industry does it, the oil industry does it, and the military does it, and you've even got some, some experience uh, there through your um, son-in-law, right? Um, so if, if you wanna comment on who else is doing this, so that people out there know that this isn't, this isn't a new idea, it's, it may be new in, within healthcare, but not necessarily new here, uh, new out, outside of, of healthcare. Go ahead, Melody. Thank you. I did notice some of the chats. There were some questions about what is it, what do we mean by abstract? So really what we're looking at are what are those situations where you're, you're basically providing a, a situation for your learners. Okay, here's a what if. They're kind of your what if situation. Here's this kind of bizarre, wild thing that you don't usually experience in a normal day. And if you were to experience this, what if? So that's kind of what, um, again, nuclear medicine or nuclear, the nuclear industry, military, as well as like um, industries like the CDC, WHO, uh, FEMA, they do them all the time. They provide these crazy outside the box situations that you would not normally experience to kind of figure out um, how can you communicate in those situations? How can you think outside the box in those situations? How would you work as a team? How would you prioritize what you need to do in these crazy things that you would not typically experience on a given day? And, and I saw that somebody uh, mm -hmm. chimed in and said virtual tabletop simulations, which is yep. perfect because I think, I think you've used that term with us before. Um, mm -hmm. Other terms for it are synthetic training, creating a synthetic training environment or live virtual constructive training. So the whole point is, is that this is not um, something necessarily new uh, and has been around for, for a while. So why don't we turn to um, our next question, which is, um, so we're coming out of COVID-19, right? Uh, and you've specifically chosen not to focus on COVID-19. COVID Why a disaster uh, response team simulation as opposed to any other type of si uh, simulation or situation? Well, to be honest with you, uh, we were trying to replicate what we did in the live world before COVID existed. So every semester, our students participate in a disaster simulation. We have um, one that we do in the fall, which is a hospital blackout. We have one in the spring that we do, which is a large motor vehicle accident, um, MCI event. So we were trying to provide that same experience for our students um, in the virtual realm. We, typically, we intentionally chose not to do a COVID just because, again, we were trying to replicate what we had done in the live setting. Um, and that you know, those very unique types of experience, which I'll share a little bit more about later in this webinar. And, and um, you had mentioned a concern before um, when, when we were just talking through this, that your feeling is that a lot of people out there are sort of, a lot of students are, are probably at this time just don't want to, they're a little COVIDed out if, if, that's, uh, if that's a word. I just invented a word. So, um, they're spent by this by this topic. So that was, I think, something else you had, you had mentioned in your. Yeah, uh, that was a big concern of from the faculty. Um, obviously, all of our students, just like everyone else's students right now, are required to do a lot of um, COVID-specific training um, as they are healthcare students, and so they are um, getting a lot of uh, COVID information already. So we wanted to kind of again. Uh, provide them with something a little bit different uh, to get their thinkers going in a different direction. Sure. Um, I see a lot of our attendees are coveted out. As yeah, well. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was that was a great comment. Um, so let's move to uh, the skills that you're seeking to develop here. Um, 
So what, uh, what skills are you helping learners develop through the process of these, of these this type of simulation? So um, again, the purpose of doing these um, large scale disaster simulations, whether live or virtual, um, is really not about the hands-on skills that they learned in their programs. It's really about um, helping them be better thinkers um, as they progress into um, the world beyond graduation. So really we focus on communication, both intra and interprofessional communication, teamwork, inter and intraprofessional team, um, teamwork, also prioritization. How do you prioritize and how do you manage your time if you only have a little bit of time and a lot to do? How do you decide what you do for second, third, fourth, et cetera? And again, those critical thinking, those outside the box type of situations. I'm going to put you in a situation you've never been before and here you're going to have maybe resources you've never seen before or limited resources and how are you going to fix this problem with uh, what you have in front of you. So really communication, teamwork, prioritization, um, and critical thinking. That's what we're focusing on. I think one of the other um, aspects of this that, uh, that caught my eye when, when you were first introducing your approach to us is that it's giving students a, a feel for what's going on at the management level, at the strategic level, somewhere up above if, if at some point they're assigned to a team that's working in the field, in a field environment, they're providing care. Um, first of all, it's, it's great to understand what the processes are upstream above you that have maybe assigned you to a particular role or put you in a particular area in the field or assigned certain resources. Also, someday those people are, are going to hopefully grow into a management role and they'll have a, a greater appreciation for what that role is like. So I, I really think the, the approach is brilliant. Before well, we move, again, oh, I'm sorry, please. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. And again, I didn't really um, talk about that leadership. Obviously there's a leadership um, component to all of these. Uh, we randomly assign leaders and those leaders rotate. So again, to do exactly what you said, give them those opportunities to look at things from a leadership perspective. Sure, excellent. So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, before we advance forward, we're gonna have another question for our audience. And the question is, do you believe your students or learners have enough opportunities to develop critical thinking skills? Do you believe they have enough opportunities to learn critical thinking skills? So we're just gonna pause for a moment and this will be an interesting lead in to uh, to our next stage in, in this interview. So we're getting some good responses from the chat, but please do make sure that you fill out the, uh, respond to the polling question. We'll give it just a few more, a few more seconds here. Let's see what the response is. So, um, 65% say no. So that's, that's pretty telling right there. 65% say no. So that's, uh, that's really a good, a good segue into where we need to go next, which is let's take a look at an example and see how you actually approach this. So we're going to go through this step by step and give everyone, um, everyone that's, that's here, a very brief overview, but a step-by-step -step overview for how you approach this. So Melody, why don't you please uh, explain to us step one. So I do want to just take a, a quick moment just to share. We um, are using um, kind of like a PowerPoint uh, simulation uh, format, and that is not what this session is about, but if there are questions about that later, we can definitely talk about that. So uh, again, to because this is a disaster, this particular scenario that I'm going to share about is specific for nursing students only. Um, it can easily be converted to uh, interprofessional, but this one was specifically developed for nursing students only. Uh, so we divided them into three teams. There's a medical team, again, there's the nursing team, and their focus is to kind of look at what are some of the medical conditions that they might encounter in this particular disaster simulation or situation. 
And then uh, what resources do they need? How would they manage them? What would they expect to see? And how are they going to deal with that? The mental health team, same questions. What kind of um, behaviors, you know, behavioral issues might you see? How can you support people during this time? What are going to be some of the mental health um, concerns that you might see during a disaster? The health promotion team, um, again, they're looking at things like basic, basic needs, food, water, housing, um, and how can they uh, support uh, people that are dealing with a disaster as part of that health promotion team. So they get divided into three teams. We start with nine students. They get divided into three teams of three, and then they work their way through the process. So um, as I kind of said, I um, kind of already alluded to what their task would be um, in each of those different teams. So they are divided in their teams, they get their assigned task, and then they're ready to go to their first disaster. So we use um, readily available resources. We use videos that are out there for everyone to use from FEMA and WHO for this particular simulation. And they get a little snippet of what's happening, and then they have to make some decisions. So, so our first I... scenario, sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Melody. I just want to make sure because we're getting some uh, some great questions in from um, the audience, but I want to make sure that we don't get our uh, ahead of ourselves for those people that have never uh, done this before, have run this kind of simulation. So you've got three teams, okay? Um, and then you give each team a task. So you've got the medical response team has a certain um, mission and, and desired outcome. Uh, at the end of at, at the end of this scenario, and then the uh, medical I'm sorry, the um, mental health team has their own mission and, and desired outcome, and then you've got the uh, basic health um, uh, support team that has their own mission and desired outcome. So we're about to get to step three, where you're going to talk to us about how to set up the. Uh, set the stage, but for stage two, when you assign people the tasks, um, do they get a written form? Do they see this on PowerPoint? And how prescriptive do you get? And what would your advice be? How prescriptive do you have to be? It's probably a better way to ask that. Yeah, so uh, thank you for um, getting me off track there, getting me back no, on no, track. No, 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 we're, we're good. <laughs> Thank so uh, we do, as I said, it's in a PowerPoint, so they can see uh, the expectations um, on the screen. We use, um, you know, we leave everything up for them to see, but they are not real specific. Uh, for the medical team, it just says what kinds of injuries or medical conditions can you expect to see and how are you going to manage those? Uh, behavior, the, for the mental health team, what kinds of behaviors might you see or what kinds of situations might you encounter? How are you going to handle those? Same with health promotion. So not real specific. Again, we want them to be the thinkers here. Um, so we're not going to be real prescriptive on what we're asking them to do. Okay, great. And we see other questions coming in, and uh, we are going to uh, we, we're going to have time for those questions uh, at at the end. So uh, that's why we're moving along at a at a at a decent pace here. But let's get to move uh, to step three. So. Uh, help us understand how you set the stage. So again, they're assigned their teams, they're assigned their very simple task or very, uh, you know, the task for each team. They are basically told your first, um, your first situation that you're going to is a hurricane on the East Coast. We use um, available FEMA videos that are um, free for everyone to use and we'll provide those resources to you at the end of the session. And we play the video. And okay, so we're gonna give you, I'm actually gonna show you just a moment, a little snippet, very, very short snippet of one of those videos. We just say, watch the video, and then we'll um, have some questions for you after. So you can just go ahead and show them that's about 30 seconds of the next video. Um, so you can kind of get a snippet of what the students might see. This is 30 okay. seconds of a, uh, this one is about a 
Three days since Hurricane Kenley came barreling ashore on the outer banks of North Carolina. Three days of mounting losses. The storm tore its way up the eastern seaboard. Its 20-foot storm surges and 120-mile-per-hour winds wreaking havoc from the Carolinas to Long Island to the New England coast. When Kenley finally made its way inland in Connecticut, its force diminished and it was downgraded to a tropical storm, but that wasn't the end of Kenley. The system dumped more than 14 inches of rain on most of New England, and now severe flooding has completely submerged many communities. We have new statistics and data about this killer storm, and the numbers and facts are stunning. The human toll continues to rise. 8,040 people are confirmed dead, with 1,120 still unaccounted for. Some who have survived are in dire straits. Nearly 2 million people need medical care, emergency shelter, and or housing. If you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Sure, um, sure. So um, just a quick question as, as we go along, and, uh, and we're fine on time. So they hear 8,000. Do you get... Mm -hmm. Do you get the look from your students that, nah, I'm uh, all right. I'm not buying into this. Or do you say whether you buy into it or not, um, embrace it because because you've got seven minutes to uh, to figure out what to do. How does that play out? So uh, this particular all of our um, disaster simulations are done for our senior level or graduating students. So they they become accustomed throughout the program that we're gonna provide you with things and you, the expectation is that you, um, you know, that you be part of that, that you embrace whatever we're providing for you as, as learning opportunities. So, but what I usually get is, oh, I wasn't expecting that many. So they had made their plans for maybe a smaller number of uh, victims or people that would be impacted. So now they get that number of 8,000 and they're like, wow, I, we have to adjust our plan. Um, and so then we tell them, okay, you've got seven minutes to adjust your plan. So what are you going to do? How are you going to address this new information that you have? How will your plans change? And what other resources might you need to help you with this information that you now have? They are actually put into breakout rooms on teams to um, talk amongst themselves. And then they come back and through that seven minute time frame, and the leader of the group reports out to everyone and shares what the group came up with. So um, just uh, to help out uh, some of the listeners, uh, because you and I are both seeing some of the questions coming in. Um, on your form or on what you show them on uh, PowerPoint, there are really two primary questions. And that is, uh, what conditions do you expect you will see? So that's getting them some, that's, that's preparing them for some empathetic skills, right? What, what can I envision? Um, right. I've, I've got to, I, I've, I can't have one dimensional thinking here. I've, I've really got to engage. Um, and then the other is, okay, what resources will I, will I need? So basically those are the two questions you're asking each team. And um, I can see that that right there could be in and of itself a huge um, strategic exercise in and of itself. So, um, but you don't ask any other questions beyond that, correct? It's, it's pretty much just that. So those are the two questions we ask them before they get all the information. So all we give them is you're heading to a disaster, um, it's a hurricane on the East Coast. These are the two questions we ask each team to consider before they know all the information. So again, that forward thinking about what they might anticipate. After they get the information or after they've watched the entire um, video, then we'll ask them different questions about, okay, so now you have different information. Now your whole plan has to change or does your plan have to change? So how would you change your plan? What additional resources might you need? Where do you go from here uh, sure. with all the new information? So someone just asked how long these are. So I think that's a good opportunity to move to the next slide um, because um, in step five, so each of these exercises is, they're allowed seven minutes, five to seven minutes, depending on, on your discretion. 
Um, then you debrief and discuss, but then you come back and you increase the difficulty. Now we won't, we don't have time unfortunately to play some of the other videos, but you keep coming back with a newer case, a newer level of intensity. So the next level of intensity may be a cholera breakout. Not only do you have the initial effects of, of the hurricane, but now, now you have a cholera breakout in the middle of this. Um, or it could be any number of things, but you just keep, you keep amping it up and then they go back for a seven minute exercise, then you have more discussion. How long could this whole process take? Would you do this over an hour and a half? Uh, would you do this over a series of, of different sessions? This particular um, experience that I'm sharing with you is one of several that we do, but this particular one is actually three hours long. They're not like in front of the virtual environment for that entire three hours. We take breaks uh, between sessions, but it's actually a two part session. The first um, part is about an hour and a half. And that's when we're in the hurricane um, situation. There are three um, levels of difficulty in that one. And then after a break, they then head off to a fictitious um, um, third world country. And then they do uh, four actual sessions in that hour and a half. And then they rotate through those different teams um, with each switch or with each change in level of difficulty. And each video gives them a completely different situation um, to kind of work through and figure out how to manage. Again, these videos actually come from uh, FEMA and WHO, and they are created to have that increased um, difficulty with each stage of the video. And we'll, and we'll talk about more about that for everybody that's listening. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in uh, just a few minutes. At the end of this, how, how do your students feel? I mean, are they, I'm sure they're feeling, ex well, you, you tell me, are they feeling exhausted? Uh, are they, um, are but are they also feeling enriched? What, what are generally people walk away from after this? Yeah, so um, again, we get some of the same comments. What's in, what was interesting to me is through this virtual um, aspect, we get some of the exact same comments from students that we got um, and feedback from them that we got when we did our live disasters, which to me tells me that we had the objectives right, that we did what we were supposed to and did what we intended to. They uh, recognize that, you know, there's a lot to things. They talk a lot about seeing the big picture. It really helped me see the big picture. And to me, that's really one of the things that we want them to be able to do. Um, I have had students tell me their brains hurt, but they also said that in our live disasters. But yeah, really just they, they love it. They um, want this to continue. They actually asked if we could continue this particular virtual simulation even when we're allowed to go back to live. So we have, are actually incorporating this uh, simulation into their program from here on out. So it's been a great experience for the students. Lots of great feedback from them. Outstanding. So let's, let's see what uh, the audience perspective is on this. So we're gonna go to another polling question. If you were to run an exercise like this with your students or learners, uh, what would be the biggest benefit in your opinion now that you've seen this. So you've got three choices, uh, student um, or learner engagement, development of critical thinking, or understanding of strategic problem solving. Um, and intentionally, there's no uh, all of the above. Um, we really wanna see where people land on this. So um, what do you think would be the best benefit? We'll just hover here for a minute until uh, everyone has a chance to respond. And I bet for some people that's going to be a difficult choice. Mm -hmm. And I've and I'm betting on which one it's going to be. We'll see how it goes. Oh. All right. I'm not seeing the uh, responses yet. Um, I am, and I see that right. development, You're... thinking, and understanding of strategic problem solving are neck and neck. Um, so which well, led first, happened? since you're seeing it, Melody, you, you can, uh, I'll just be co-pilot for a while. Um, so which came out first? So uh, development, uh, or actually understanding of strategic problem solving was 45%, and 
and development of critical thinking is 44%. So those two really are neck and neck. And, and again, I think that um, this uh, scenario would do that for your students, definitely. Excellent. And um, next time we need to, um, people are telling us that we need to be able to choose more than just one. So that's good. We're glad people are engaged. So um, let's move now to uh, where everyone should begin. Um, and what you're seeing there, by the way, I, I, I love this photo because it's actually a picture of, of the mobile hospital <clears throat> that was established in the stadium in Sao Paulo, Brazil, during COVID-19. And it's amazing um, just the, 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 the size of it and also how quick it went up. I mean, we've ha had our own examples here in the States, but that's, that's a great example um, in uh, Latin America. Where should people begin as they're planning this? There are some basics that you'd like to advise people on. Yeah, um, always begin with objectives. You know, what is the purpose of the activity? Why are you doing it? And then is this modality, is this the right um, modality? And I don't mean like virtual versus live, but is this the right situation to meet those objectives? And then leveling it to your learner is huge. I did see a couple comments in the chats about this is a high level expectation. It is. This is not an activity for your novice learners at all. And then pull out those ANASCO standards, those simulation scenario design standards, and follow them. Uh, so every virtual, every simulation you do should follow those ANASCO standards. And uh, though if you have objectives, Level your learner and use those ANASCO standards to develop it, you are set to go. Awesome, thank you. And uh, since you mentioned the ANASCO best practices, why don't we turn now to um, the, the topic of debriefing? Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that debriefing is a major component in this and, and that's really, um, well, I don't, I don't wanna put, I, I, I don't wanna lead you. So, Please comment on debriefing and, and what your experience has been about the role of debriefing in this. So debriefing is huge, huge. And you actually have to break up your debriefing. You need to debrief after every single um, encounter, as we call them, uh, for our students. So if they are doing a level one um, hurricane encounter, we're going to debrief after that. Um, why did you make those decisions? Tell me more about why you think you need this particular resource. So more digging into the why they made the decisions that they made after each encounter. And then at the very end of the um, scenario, so before we take that break after an hour and a half, we're actually going to debrief um, what went well as a team, what, you know, what could you have done differently as a team, What's your big takeaway? And then we want to always tie into how are you gonna use this information in your practice when you graduate? Okay, so you are, you just got done with a hurricane. You're not gonna go uh, probably, we're in Iowa, hurricanes are not the norm for us. So you're not gonna be in a hurricane when you graduate, but how can you use what you just did and apply it to when you go work at the small county hospital in rural Iowa? So always making those connections between what they're learning and how they can apply that to practice. Excellent, thank you. And someone uh, just uh, asked what INAXL is. Uh, so that is the International Nursing uh, Association for Clinical and Learning um, Standards. Clinical Correct? Simulation or, and Learning. Thank you. The International um, Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, so it's um, it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, but if you if you do Google um, in Axel I N A C S L, you should be good. All right. Yeah, and the standard that I referred to, all the standards are free downloads. So it's the scenario design standard that you want to utilize to develop your activities. So excellent. And um, if anybody has a question on that one, again, they can um, just go into the Q&A and we'll make sure we'll add more detail later. So um, this can also uh, be a, a good segue to 
hands-on scenarios? And have you ever used this as a, as a segue to, uh, for your students to now get involved in the very end result of all their planning? Okay, now you get to go into the field and perform one of these scenarios. Um, in this particular case, uh, we don't um, because we can't um, create a hurricane. We can't provide those um, earthquake, you know, the, the ones when we go to the third world country, there are earthquakes and cholera and um, um, all kinds of interesting things that are happening over there. But uh, we can't. And that's what's so great about this type of activity is we can provide those learning experiences and we don't need all the resources to do hands on. Um, I know we're kind of, uh, we want some time for questions. Um, I will um, just kind of feed in on what you talked about earlier about some experience with my son-in-law who is in the military. They do put those into practice. So the strategic planning occurs and then they're the ones that then go out and uh, try it and see how it worked and then come back and uh, provide feedback to the command structure about what worked and what didn't work. Um, I, we do, as I mentioned earlier, we do hands-on disaster simulations as part of our program, uh, but not these because we can't do that. So it's been great to do it in the virtual realm and provide those very unique learning opportunities. I like what you mentioned about your son-in-law because that would be, uh, I know if I were a student, that would be great to, to actually now be able to go to the other extreme from that strategic extreme now to the tactical extreme where um, you're uh, now executing on one of the scenarios. Okay, now I've, I designed all the resources. I, um, I had some, I, I gave some thought to what the conditions are going to be like. Now I'm going to perform in a scenario to see how this really does play out. So that'd be kind of neat. So yeah, why don't we, would... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. No, um, I just said it would be. <laughs> So let's uh, let's move to um, well. You had mentioned times, and now I looked at the time, and I thought, oh, we got to get to all these great questions that are coming in. But we still we still have one other topic to talk about, and the resources you use, and you use quite a bit. I mean, we've got we've got this photo here of FEMA up, but you you use a lot more than uh, exclusively FEMA. So maybe you could talk about that, please. Yeah, and uh, we'd be happy to share um, how to access those resources um, a little bit later. But so I used videos from uh, FEMA, and um, the FEMA website has a a lot of options. They again, they're free downloads um, for education purposes. Um, I used videos from the World Health Organization. Again, those are available for free downloads. Um, both FEMA and the World Health Organization have. Uh, facilitator guides to go with all their videos. They have um, questions for learners to go with all their videos. They have some actually sample PowerPoints that you can download and embed videos into. So lots of great resources from those two organizations. I also use resources from the Global Health Response Corps, which is a medical corps that goes to disasters all over the country or all over the world. And then the National um, Health um, disaster Response Team, which is a FEMA um, and Department of Health um, organization that responds to disasters in the U.S. So I use all of those resources to create uh, this uh, particular simulation. Excellent. And we will, uh, at, at the conclusion of this, we have some links out to those resources for everyone. So please stand by. Why don't we move now to uh, audience questions. So, and we've got some really good ones. And uh, we're going to turn to um, one of our staff members, uh, Caitlin Walker, who's going to read off some of those questions for us. Caitlin? So, we have a lot of questions coming in um, regarding what's provided to students before beforehand. Great question. Um, so, yes, yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, Again, these are our senior level students. We do not provide them a lot of information when we do the disasters live, other than the situation. So we provide them with a little snippet. You are members of the, we call it the DMAC um, Global um, Healthcare Response Team. We tell them what the different um, teams will be. We tell them that they'll be put into different teams. We tell them what the expectations will be when you're in the teams and just we just say you will be traveling around the world to um, go to disasters 
And that's pretty much it. We do give them links to the Global Disaster Response Corps and the uh, National Healthcare Disaster Response Team website. But those are, that's pretty much it. We just say be prepared to uh, do what you're expected to do and we go from there. Again, critical thinking outside the box. We want them to be thinking in the moment, thinking on their feet. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Caitlin, what's another question that people have? Over the course of the simulation, do you keep students in the same role or do you rotate them? Great, right, great question. question. Yep, we actually rotate them. So with every team, there's a leader, as I said, there's nine students, three teams, and then um, there's three disaster situations in each uh, scenario. So they rotate through the different teams and then they also rotate through the leadership role. Everybody gets to be a leader and everybody gets to be on all three of those teams. Great, thank you. Are students assigned their own patient? Uh, they are not assigned a patient. The whole purpose of this is that more big picture experience rather than the individual patient um, situation or individual patient experiences. We want them to look at things from that big picture perspective. So they're not assigned a patient, they're assigned everybody that might be in this disaster. If you're asking about when we do it live, it's the same way, we don't assign them a particular patient. We assign a leader and they have to do assignments however they see fit um, based on the individual. I hope that answered that question. Do you allow participants to open references? Uh, so references during this scenario, of course we do. We allow them to use whatever reference they want or whatever resources. Uh, we are very strong on um, everybody doesn't need to know everything, but you need to know how to find your resources. They are constantly Googling uh, during this activity, I can guarantee you, because they will come back and say, I didn't know what that, we talk about cholera, that I, that's actually something that occurs in one of our disaster situations. And so they will, they will Google cholera because they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what they would need to do for the health promotion team to help prevent that. So yes, we let them use whatever resources they want. So here's a two part question. How do you use this in your program and do they count as clinical hours? Okay, great question. So we do it, use it, um, our disaster simulations in our last course of the semester for our nursing students is called their preceptorship course, leadership management course, and that's where that's when occurs. Um, does it count as clinical time? Yes, it does. Um, obviously with COVID, some things changed based on your state. So we were allowed to use this virtual one as clinical time. Uh, we are, have been in the past allowed to use the live ones as clinical time. That'll be state specific. So you'll want to check with your state. How do your students communicate virtually? So for this particular situation, we put them into a uh, team's breakout room so that they can um, communicate there. However, uh, they've also FaceTimed, called each other, text each other. Um, we let them figure out what communication strategy will work best for them if Teams isn't quite being cooperative, which occurs sometimes. So you could do this as a, uh, as a Zoom Mm -hmm. exercise and your students could do this quite well virtually for, the, yes. for those people that are in that situation right now. Yes, correct. Yeah, right. then that's how we did it. Um, we use Teams only because that's the one the college recommended that we use or asked that we use. So you could do the same thing in Zoom sure. Um, sure. and do it virtually. Our students were not in a classroom together. I think the photos kind of gave you, they might have given you the impression they were together in a classroom. That is not the case. They were all on their home computers um, participating in this activity. Very good. How do you evaluate your students' performance? Do you use a rubric? Uh, so we um, do use a rubric. It's the same one that we use for our uh, any other virtual simulation that we use. And really for us, um, in our program, simulation is to hone those, um, what we call readiness for practice or professional behaviors of a nurse is how they're termed in our program. 
It's really looking at communication, participation, uh, teamwork, those types of things. In our simulations in our program, in our nursing program, we do not evaluate their tactile, physical psychomotor skills. We only evaluate the uh, more cognitive skills, and so we can use that same evaluation tool here. In the pre-learning, do you introduce concepts of incident command? Uh, we do not um, do that. I do know that we have talked about using a very similar activity for our paramedic program, and we would definitely do that. That is something that's more in their realm. Uh, we do not in this particular activity, but it's surely something we could consider. Do you debrief with students all together or individually? No, we debrief as an entire group, just like we would in a live simulation. And just throw those questions out to the entire group. These are great questions. How are we, how are we doing on uh, more questions coming, Caitlin? They've slowed a bit, so if okay. we want to elaborate just, on anything else. I, I'd like to ask, well, first of all, I'd like to remind the audience to please put the questions in the Q&A because um, we've got a chat going and we've got a Q&A. Um, also, uh, I, ha I have a question. When it comes to resources, do you put any kind of boundary on what types of resources people need so they don't go off the, go off the rails, so to speak? Um, do you say, all right, we're, we're not interested in Transportation. Well, I, I'm I'm thinking of transportation that goes beyond medical transportation. Um, do you put limits on housing? I I would imagine not. But I, I'm seeing a. I guess you don't put any limits on on this. Okay. Well, and again, this is really about helping them think outside the box. So you know, kind of think about those brainstorming activities. That's really what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to really start to use their thinkers. Uh, they have come up with some very interesting um, solutions to some of the issues that are presented. Uh, for example, in one case, there was a lot of flooding and debris that was up against um, housing. And so they decided, okay, they're gonna get tanks from the military to help move all that. So, I mean, they just come up with these wild, crazy ideas, and then we have to start to kind of work through, okay, all right, fine, um, how are you going to make that happen? You know, what, what, you know, what will work, what won't work? So, again, this is really about critical thinking and outside-the-box thinking and helping to kind of hone those skills. So, no, we don't limit their resources. We do ask, where did you get that resource, or where did you come up with that one? Um, and then if it's not a reputable site maybe that they're using, we'll talk about why that might not be a good place to get your information. Sure. Okay, great. So, Caitlin, do we have any more questions? Uh, no, we covered most of them. That's, that's fine, because I've got a burning question. <laughs> okay. Um, what is your favorite success story with this? With this particular activity, um, I would think probably the biggest success story is when the students come back to me and say, wow, I, I really learned a lot, but really just thinking about, again, going back to that big picture thinking. When they're able to say to us, wow, I never thought about this, or I really didn't realize how um, one thing could cause so many other things to occur. Because when we ask that question about how are you going to apply this to practice, because that's always the big kicker for us, is how are you going to apply this, that they can really see some of the things that they could apply from this bizarre activity and that they could really apply those to the clinical, th the clinical setting. So to me, our biggest successes are when the students can put those pieces together, when they can make those connections about how what we did could be used in the real world. And I could provide hundreds of examples, but I think that's kind of the big um, success story is when they can actually take this situation that is almost what they would think is unrealistic and be able to apply that information to uh, a real world setting. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melody. I think at uh, this point we're going to 
give you back just a few minutes in, in your day. You've been so um, uh, wonderful to be with us. And again, it's been an, an honor and a privilege. I just want to make sure everybody um, has, uh, first of all, your, your uh, name and title here in case they want to reach out. Um, so thank you again, Melody Bethards from Des Moines Area Community College. Um, Melody has, has graciously uh, accepted our invitation to join our um, Sun Facebook page. So um, I just want to make sure everybody understands right away that Melody will not be there 24-7. Um, <laughs> but if, if you join our Sun Facebook group, um, Melody will be there and hopefully this discussion will continue. Mm -hmm. um, also, we promised some resources. So we've got um, the International Medical Corps web link, which everybody will have a copy of later, the National Disaster Medical System link, FEMA, uh, the World Health Organization uh, link, and uh, also Lairdall would like to make sure everybody, uh, even though you're not focusing on COVID-19, and um, I, I, I'm hearkening back to that statement at the beginning here that students are, students are a little COVIDed out, um, but still, we have an exceptional resource center there for people if you need to um, uh, do something in the realm of uh, COVID-19. And also, please sign up for our future uh, virtual SUNS. We've got a whole series planned for uh, 2020, and Melody, you were the first. So uh, first here for the Americas. We've, we've done some stuff globally, but now we're bringing it here uh, to North America, and you were the first here for North America. And we thank you. We thank you very much. It's been great. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I really appreciate the ability to be able to share and hopefully it was helpful to everyone. And please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions or however I can help you with your um, experiences. Thank you, Melody. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, um, we hope you have a, a very successful year as we return back to uh, whatever the normalcy will be. Uh, as we go into the future, but uh, remember Laird all is here to help and we're very humbled to have so many wonderful people like you, Melody, um, here to help our, uh, our clients in the simulation community. Well, again, thank you for everything you're doing to provide these opportunities for people, especially uh, for free, so that we can get this information. Well, thank you. You bet. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.